today. Our lecture for obstetrics would be on post-term pregnancy. This is a statement made by Williams circa 1903. He stated that it must be admitted that the duration of pregnancy infrequently exceeds 280 days from the last menstrual period, and that when it lasts much longer, large children are developed, which are frequently delivered only after great difficulty. Thus, whenever the menstrual history of the patient indicates that she has passed much beyond the 10th and is approaching the 11th lunar month, we should consider the propriety of the induction of labor provided that examination shows the child is larger than usual. So, it is evidence that 100 years ago, it was a problem and it still remains a problem today. So the contents of our lecture would be introduction to the post-term pregnancy, significance, clinical approach, and management. So where first we start with definitions. You have learned in the previous lecture that preterm pregnancy is any delivery before 37 weeks of gestation. A term pregnancy is from 37 to 39 weeks and 6 days, late term is 41 weeks to 41 and 6, and post term or prolonged pregnancy, which is the topic of our lecture, is 42 weeks onwards. So by definition, it is any pregnancy that exceeds 42 weeks or 294 days from the first day of last menstrual period in women with regular 28-day cycles. It could be termed post-date pregnancy or prolonged pregnancy. The incidence is generally quoted as 0.4% delivered beyond 42 weeks this is according to Martin, 2017, in your Williams. In the U.S., incidence is 5.5%. So this is according to the American College of OBGYN, circa 2014. Incidence is decreasing because of better estimation of duration of gestation and timely induction of labor. Variation results from differences in practices in management as the due date approaches. Risk factors of post-term pregnancy would include a past history of prolonged pregnancy, so any previous post-term pregnancy increases the risk. Family history of prolonged pregnancy meaning it could be biologically determined. It could be determined by race. It is said that white more often experiences post-term pregnancies. We have fetal placental factors such as anencephaly, adrenal hypoplasia, and X-linked placental sulfatase deficiency. BMI, which is greater than or equal to 25, nulliparity, and cervical length also play a factor in post-term pregnancies. We have a myriad of complications in post-term pregnancy, hence the significance of knowing when to induce or when to uh, allow for spontaneous vaginal delivery. For fetal complications, there could be macrosomia syndrome. A large baby would continue to develop in the womb. Dismaturity syndrome, which we will learn in the later slides. Stillbirth, neonatal seizures, meconium aspiration, low 5-minute APGAR scores, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathies, and birth injuries. Maternal complications would include anxiety, dysfunctional labor, an increased 
rate of cesarean section, macrosomia, preeclampsia, dystocia, fetal jeopardy, postpartum hemorrhage, and perineal laceration. So for the fetal complications, there's a macrosomia syndrome. This occurs when placental function is maintained and this occurs in approximately 80% of cases. This results in healthy but large fetus. So amniotic fluid is normal and increased risk of cesarean section because of prolonged and arrested labor because of an enlarged fetus. And most often, it ends up in shoulder dystocia. Post-maturity syndrome is when placental function deteriorates. This occurs in approximately 20% of cases. Placental insufficiency results in reduction of metabolic and respiratory support to fetus. Amniotic fluid is decreased. Increased risk of cesarean section because of non-reassuring fetal heart rate patterns. And oligohydramia results in umbilical cord compression. A post-term pregnancy would produce a post-mature infant with a unique and characteristic appearance produced by a pathologically prolonged pregnancy. This would include wrinkled, patchy, peeling, skin, a long thin body suggestive of wasting, advanced maturity, open eyes which are alert and appears worried, wrinkling of palms and soles, long nails, incidence of which would be 10% of pregnancies between 41 and 43 weeks. For maternal complications, we have anxiety. So it is commonly seen in women who are already past their due date. Most will express concern that they haven't delivered yet. So we will just have to reassure the patient that post-term pregnancy is actually two weeks after the due date. Chances of increased prolonged labor are also there. Increased risk of instrumental delivery is also present. And of course, the increased risk of cesarean section is present in post-term pregnancy. Pathophysiology of dysfunction of the placenta would be a dysfunctional syncytiotrophoblast uh, along with the loss of the protective effects of the vernix gaseosa which diminish as the pregnancy gets prolonged. So there would be placental senescence and evidence of placental apoptosis with the increase of the um, and of, of kispeptin, a, a pre-programmed apoptosis indicator, and a decrease in fetal oxygenation. There is a relationship between fetal distress and oligohydramnios. Cord compression associated with oligohydramnios produces non-reassuring fetal status. The decreased amniotic fluid along with the decrease in fetal urine flow would result in a viscous meconium resulting in your P or meconium aspiration amniotic fluid. There are also fetal growth complications. So your growth restricted post term has a higher morbidity and mortality. Of course, with less distension because your fetus is small, it would not send signal for your uterus to contract. Hence, your uterus would not go into labor at the supposed time. So earlier delivery, of course, is indicated if there are other obstetric complications. 
such as oligohydramnios, macrosomia, and of course the obvious hypertension, diabetes, etc. and should not reach post-term pregnancy. Two strategies are recommended to reduce the diagnosis of post-term and late-term gestations. One is accurate dating using firm clinical criteria, so known ovulation date or early ultrasound, the latter of which can reduce the rate of post-term pregnancy, and membrane sweeping when there are no contraindications for placenta previa and perhaps group B streptococcus uh, infection. So we have to confirm the gestational age. So in a book, case confirmation of gestational age is easily determined. However, for patients that are lost to follow up, diagnosis of first term pregnancy possesses a major challenge. Determination of gestational age could be done by the following. History. First day of last menstrual period, an early ultrasound because it has the least amount of variation, family history, and history of neural tube defects. Of course, in the examination, you have to know your Bishop score to know if your cervix is favorable to induce. Again, your bishop score would consist of your cervical dilatation, effacement, position, consistency, and station. So review how to score your bishop score in your previous. There are no definitive studies that show that antepartum surveillance actually decrease perinatal morbidity and mortality. ACOG suggests due to advanced gestational age that is linked to stillbirth, antenatal surveillance may be indicated. Ultrasonographic assessment to look for oligohydramnios is warranted. This is your modified BPP, that's your NST, plus amniotic fluid index determination twice weekly after 41 weeks. So we have ways to test for the fetus. Of course, we monitor by ultrasound, doing our non-stress test, fetal movement counting, and amniotic fluid index. So conservative management would be allowing for spontaneous labor. So 50% of women going beyond 42 weeks of gestation experience spontaneous labor in 4 to 5 days, especially in women with poor bishop score. And we have documented good fetal health and adequate placental function. Induction of labor would be done to people with a favorable cervix. Patients with oligohydramnios, with fetal macrosomia, babies presenting with a non-reactive NST, and with a favorable patient. So induction of labor at 41 weeks results in fewer perinatal deaths and fewer cesarean sections. Fewer cases of meconium aspiration syndrome such that induction of labor can be considered between 41 weeks and 42 weeks, and induction of labor is recommended for patients beyond 42 weeks, given the evidence of an increase in perinatal morbidity and mortality. So this is an algorithm for patients for 41 weeks, if it's uncomplicated, we could continue with fetal surveillance, do membrane sweeping, or do labor induction. If there are complications such as hypertension and oligohydramnios, we do labor induction. If we reach 42 weeks, we proceed with labor induction. 
We use a variety of inducing agents, prostaglandin E2 and E1. However, it is not available here. What we use for induction would be dinoprostone, brand name Primigen or Serviprime, and membrane sweeping to dilate and produce naturally synthetic prostaglandins. So references would be the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, Practice Bulletin, Managing Postterm Pregnancies, and of course, your Williams 25th edition. Thank you for listening to this OBGYN lecture. For more lectures, please do look at my YouTube channel. It's Audrey Angeli Andres for more lectures on OBGYN. Thank you.